The speakers for this panel are all faculty staff or recent graduates from the University of Hong Kong who have decided to start their own business their adventure to bring their research outcome to the real world. Now we have always heard that doing biotechnology is difficult. It requires very specialized knowledge, which means that you have to go to school for many years, study for many years. It takes a long time because the experimental animals need to sleep. <laughs> and it requires heavy investment because the equipments and reagents are very expensive. There are stringent regulatory requirements, which means you have to deal with the bureaucratic government departments and very high failure rates. So it appears that doing biotechnology for an academic is it's not just half hoi, but half wu hoi. So that makes us wonder, why do they still want to jump into these deep waters? So today, we're fortunate enough to invite this, our guest speakers to come and share with us. They will tell us a little bit about their company and their journey from dream to reality. Well, our first speaker for the session is Dr. Barbara, Barbara Chen, the founder of the company Living Tissues Limited. Just some background. Dr. Chen obtained her bachelor's degree in biochemistry and her PhD degrees in surgical science with post and postdoctoral training from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Then she did a second postdoctoral postdoctoral fellowship in photomedicine in Harvard Medical School. Dr. Chen joined the biomedical engineering program of the University of Hong Kong in 2003. Her research interests are musculoskeletal tissue engineering, stem cell biomaterial interactions, multi-photon biofabrication, and mechanical regulation. But what is not mentioned in the speaker's profile is that she actually had worked in the Innovation and Technology Commission for some time before she started her academic career. So now I may I invite Dr. Chen to come to the stage and tell a share of us her evolution from a humble civil servant to a bar entrepreneur. Dr. Chen, please. Thank you very much, Cecilia. I actually, I would um, mention that. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, and I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share um, our dreams. Okay. Um, so, this one. Thank you. Um, so, in 1999, and when the industri industry department is renamed in to um, ITC, Innovation and Technology Commission. Sorry, this one. Um, a, a PhD, a fresh PhD graduate, um, that was me, um, joined the government to help uh, Dr. Sunny Jang, sitting over there, um, to operate on the small entrepreneur research assistant program, CREP. And um, that was um, a scheme to help startup companies. And he took me to visit almost 200 companies within a single year. And we have seen a lot of um, beautiful stories about entrepreneurs. For example, three um, engineering uh, master graduates, uh, they form a company developing uh, electronic toys. A university professor, um, uh, together with um, his postdoc and PhD, and form a company on telecommunication uh, solutions and so on. So that was the first time that you know there was a picture that was in my mind and that I wish to develop something on like off-the-shelf tissue products that can help people with rupture tendon and ligament. That was actually a continuation of my PhD work. And I was so excited whenever I saw these pictures projected in my mind and um, um, I really want to do something about it, but I don't know how. Um, so by then, the ITF, Innovation and Technology Fund, um, was up and running, and I was asked to help to handle some of the proposals. And um, that was even more stimulating whenever I see biotech project. I you know a lot of images, hopefully not illusions, so come into my mind. 
And um, um, so, uh, you know, I, I really want to do something. And one day, uh, my supervisor, Dr. Uh, Sang Yi Jian, came and talked to me. He actually suggested me to go back to biomedical research. Uh, he think I was that type. And uh, he also t told me that um, um, whenever we talk about biotech project, uh, your eyes were sparkling, and that was a good sign. That's what he told me. And um, so a supervisor came in and told you about this. You can interpret either as a softer version of saying, hey, you, you're no longer suitable for this position, <laughs> or, or that was a hot, heartfelt suggestion on my career. So I certainly choose the second one to believe, and I thank him for his advice. Um, so in 2000, I joined uh, MGH in Boston and started to develop the photochemical tissue bonding technology, which is a laser-based technology, uh, basically sutureless um, uh, surgeries for wound healing. And I also work on a number of uh, projects on tissue engineer of skin, tendon, and esophagus. Um, so tissue engineering was actually a field that you use cells and some biomaterials together with other methods that you bioengineer living tissues for replacement of defective ones. Actually, that sort of like exactly was the image come or the picture come into my mind, and I enjoy so much. Uh, and enjoy so much. And in MGH, we have a lot of these uh, regular mixers, okay, with clinicians, scientists, engineers, regulatory people, company executive, lawyers, and so on. So we sit together and we talk, and um, um, that was really a good culture of uh, cross-discipline innovation and also uh, entrepreneurship. So if one had to have some kind of failure experience, um, in order to be qualified to qualify as an entrepreneurial person, I had one that uh, three of us, an MBA student from MIT and a patent lawyer from Tufts U, and myself from MGH as a scientist working on the photochemical cross-linking technology, we participate in the MIT 50K business competition, and then we were lucky to be one of the seven finalists on that year. Um, but Perhaps 2002, due to the second economy, so after rounds of pitching and meeting with VCs, actually nothing really happened. But one day, when I was visiting the operation theater in the burn units in Shriners Hospital across the street, and talked to Dr. Sheridan, the head pediatric surgeon, um, on our collaborations in skin project, and he showed me this case that a stepfather of a four-year-old girl had put her on fire. And that tiny body was covered all over, different type of dressings, different type of donor tissues, and also some art, uh, artificial tissue for temporary use. And he said that um, she simply had too little healthy skin left to take enough cells for a neighbor company in Cambridge to make a bioengineer skin. And therefore, he can only get a piece of light this size from her own cells. And then he actually used this for the most difficult area. That was actually the kneecap. And he was saying that um, he wished there were, uh, there were more supplies of these tissues and uh, because all the other solutions were just temporary to buy time. So I see the doctor he, he said that he could not, he, he, he could just wait, with, uh, could not do anything about it. So that shocking experience basically assured me the importance and the impact of the tissue engineering technology that we were developing um, for the healthcare and well-being of um, uh, mankind. So in 2004, I joined the biomedical engineering program in Hong Kong U, which is a platform to train young engineers with um, both engineering and life science principles and tools to solve biomedical problems, including uh, lack of donor tissues for a lot of uh, tissue uh, injuries and defects. 
So that was the 2007 batch, the final year, and my students uh, Daniel and uh, Annie sitting over there, they were there, yeah, that was their final year, and um, they both of them joined uh, my lab, the tissue engineering lab, and uh, did their PhD. So in our lab, we, um, in 10 years, we developed uh, seven platform technologies in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine and train 20 PhDs, MPhils, and postdocs in this um, expertise. Um, among those technologies, um, uh, some of them do have a lot of potential to, uh, to be commercialized. And this series of cartilage regeneration technologies developed by um, uh, uh, many uh, people uh, headed by any mature and then uh, we actually um, would like to turn this into real um, applications and, uh, and, and business. So during that period of time, um, people in our lab, including postdoc, MPhil, PhD, and, and also research assistant, they uh, form a technology development small group uh, on a voluntary basis, um, headed by Daniel. Um, we regularly sit down and we look, we look at technologies um, of other companies, we do patent searching, and then we brainstorm on how to turn ideas, and then some of them will propose new ideas. And um, they also participate in, in activities such as Entrepreneur Academy uh, organized by Hong Kong U. So, um, so that was actually um, how uh, we uh, develop our technology, and um, we uh, uh, both uh, Daniel and Annie graduated in 2011. So on the other side of the story, um, Dr. Sunny Zhang, he continued to inspire, stimulate, and also help people, particularly young people, to turn ideas into realities. He helped a lot of people. And uh, himself, he run a, a lot of uh, business on technologies as well. Um, he actually maintained a very close dialogue with me after I left ITC. Um, and, and he um, encouraged us and um, helped us to um, uh, start a new venture. Daniel, uh, my PhD student, um, he actually worked in a very big company for a while and having some uh, experience of running his own company or business um, he come back to me and still he still dreams about um, turning the research he had done into real business. Um, and Annie, she has been working on the cartilage regeneration technology in the big animal model all the way. And then um, she also dreams about making our technology the best in the field. Um, so then Sunny invite us to a lot of these exhibitions, technologies, and preach us and then um, he encouraged and helped us to uh, start this new venture. So in two, 2014, we established a company called Living Tissues. You may wonder what exactly you are developing. So in that company, uh, we develop cartilage regeneration technologies. So do you feel discomfort and pain in your knees when you sit for too long or climbing up the stairs and so on? In fact, uh, cartilage um, uh, diseases are very common, affecting more than 40% of the age population that is getting younger. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you have trauma or sports injury, your shiny and white cartilage could be something like this. And for those with degenerated diseases such as osteoarthritis, these are the joint surfaces taken out from the total joint replacement surgery. And then you can see the TB and the femur, basically not much cartilage was left. So among all treatment, surgical treatment, uh, the best outcome actually come from so-called clinical gold standard using autograph, which is actually a, a procedure to take many of these uh, small cylinders of cartilage and bone and called autograph from the non-load bearing area of the same knee and when you have a defect here and then you stuff in those uh, cylinders to repair this side but this is a zero-sum game because basically you, lead, you leave a lot of um, defect uh, in the cartilage. Um, and then cartilage has no blood vessel, therefore they cannot heal. And uh, soon after the operation, usually complaints at the donor sites, including pain degeneration starts. 
So we believe ideal cartilage, technolo uh, cartilage regeneration technology is an off-the-shelf, made-to-order, um, um, autograph comparable cartilage tissue uh, deriving from patient's own cells and uh, without hurting the precious cartilage. And indeed, our technology was using bone marrow stromal cells or stem cells uh, using a minimal invasive procedure from the patient. And then we had the cells expanded and mixed with clinically useful materials and had them grown uh, into a complex cartilage and bone structure mimicking the native um, structure of the cartilage. And this actually represents our fourth generation technology, which has been proven in animal models with efficacy, with rapid regeneration of the hyaline cartilage, um, with the outcome that, that are actually comparable with the autograft and a prevention of uh, long-term degeneration. So um, some orthopedic surgeons from the major hospitals in Hong Kong are actually on our clinical advisory board and um, because they are eager to try out technologies um, in human. On living tissues, we aim to translate our cartilage regeneration technology into uh, human use at affordable price. Um, we um, welcome partners and investors sharing our vision. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. In the interest of time, I think we will proceed with the presentations from all the speakers before we sit down together to do the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. Well, our second speaker today is Dr. Calvin Yeo. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Well, Dr. Yeo is trained as a material scientist, and then he studied orthopedic science uh, for his master's and PhD degrees in Hong Kong U. His major research areas covers spinal deformity correction, the development of metallic and polymeric orthopedic bar materials, design and this bone and impress design and development, as well as musculoskeletal tissue engineering. Kevin is a passionate orthopedic scientist. So patient's benefits is always in his mind. So now I would like to invite Kevin to come on stage and tell us something about how he got motivated to punch into the deep waters. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. So I guess I'm not going to sell you any products of the company today. I just want to share how the Beatles story behind it and how we can actually make the dream happen today. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So basically, our uh, AutoSmart is actually uh, a company just found half a year ago, if I remember correctly. And basically, our mission is actually to translate all the research findings, promising research findings, from the bench size to the back size for the benefits of the patient. And th this is the first product that we, we have been launched. There's actually something about the scoliosis correction. Maybe if you don't really know what is a scoliosis, basically it's actually something about the spinal deformity and then you will see the patients like that. Then basically you will have to surgically correct it. Mm. And then this is the implant mm. that we develop for years. And then this picture, I would like to share with you, this is a very interesting picture. We interviewed by the Hong Kong U Press that period of time, it's about 2005, 10 years ago. And then basically this is a group of team members, including clinicians, engineers, and also the biomechan biomechanical engineering scientists as well. And why I just put the donkey hat right over my head, over my face. And basically, I would like to tell you, if you want to be uh, a kind of entrepreneur, or basically, if you want to really to develop a, a product from bench size to the bad size, you have genetically genetically modified with the donkey DNA. Otherwise, it never happens. One is that because we work on these projects for a long period of time. And then this story, somehow, I, I got a failure as well. And Cecilia with us all the, 
all, all these because we secured the IPC funding a long time ago. And then that period of time, we, uh, we almost translate these products to the Johnson & Johnson company. Oh, sorry, not Johnson Johnson, the Putin synthesis. Mm. But it's about 2008 or 2010, I can't really remember. In that period of time, Johnson & Johnson acquired the Depute synthesis. They merged together, two big companies merged together. At that time, when we make the deal with the Depute uh, with the synthesis, and then when we talk about this with Johnson & Johnson again, and then Johnson & Johnson said, oh, forget about it, there's no more synthesis. This is called Depute synthesis, and that period of time is about 2010. We almost translate these technology and then selling all the patents, all things, to Johnson John, uh, to the uh, synthesis. But suddenly, the two companies merge together, forget everything. We have to start it over. So we experienced failure that period of time as well. And then, next line is actually something about another story of myself recently we found off this market. If you're asking me, well, I'm actually in my profession, so I'm actually in, in this level. What if we're talking about the entrepreneur, I'm actually starting here. These, these months, we found a company, we have to do fundraising, although my mentor, Dr. Johnson now, always mentioned that money is not an issue to him, but it's to me. And then basically, Mr. Bang Tang, we just mentioned about the business proposal yesterday, late evening, in about 10 p.m. Then we started talking about the business proposal. Everything back in my head, what is the PNL performer? I don't even know how to spell the performer. What is a PNL? I don't even know that. Cash flow, back in my head. And also sales forecast, sensitivity analysis, all these new terms, terminologies are quite new to me. I never learned about it because I trained it as a scientist. But if we try to step on to be the entrepreneur, we have to start everything. We have to learn. And I'm still learning how to do the business in this area. I hope that I can actually share with you a lot of the information of my graduate from the kindergarten at the end of this year. Another story is that very interesting is that I, when we start the company, then the implant, including all these materials and so on and so forth. And then we have to solicit one of the OEM to help manufacture all these implants out. We are not going to build the plant. We're not going to build the GMP standard factory to build all this because it's a large investment at the beginning. Then the best way is to do is try to find an OEM. And then the number of time, we found one OEM in far away from Shanghai. And, and cities called Jiang Yin. I'm not quite sure how many you know. Where's Jiang Yin? Oh, Stephen, you know that. You have been there. Stephen, you know that there is a somewhere, nowhere in Wuxi. Then I, that, that evening, I took the fly from Hong Kong to Shanghai. There is no direct flight from Hong Kong to Jiang Yin. And most nearby is actually Nanjing or Wuxi, or you can actually fly to Shanghai and then take the high speed train to Wuxi and then somebody picked me up to Jiang Yin. I start my trip 9 a.m. that morning and then I, I still remember I arrived Jiang Yin in 10 p.m. because the flight delay and so on and so forth. This is a very tough. I basically I just got my tenure position this January. And then basically everyone wants to say that, Professor, if you've got the tenure contract, it means what? It means you have a happy life. <laughs> Is that right? Mm -hmm. You get a happy life until 60. Then why I step in out of the comfort zones and I jump into the uh, bit of water again? Basically, everything is about patience. And then, although the water is bitter, the story is tough, but basically I'm very happy that every these key factors make this story happen. One is that I think the timing the right timing is a very important. We got a very mature product ready to translate to the bad side. And then the second thing is the atmosphere. I think now today Hong Kong government they promote 
and the advocate of the entrepreneurship, in innovations, technologies, startups, and so on and so forth. Uh, government policies help us a lot. And also the, the social recognition is the people uh, trying to learn how to fail. And then the social recognition is, it doesn't matter because we're just talking about the one of the questions is that, hey, every parent, conventionally, you will, you will it's easier to accept that uh, your kids are being success rather than be accepting your kids being failed. And Ron and I just discussed this. Of course, of the education system, uh, this is a very fundamental question in Hong Kong. And then now, the social recognition is starting to learn how we can actually uh, build up the startup company and so on and so forth. And lastly, it's the right people. I have a very good academic mentor, Professor Kenneth Chong, and also a business mentor, Dr. Johnson. Now, in the having said that, we have a very good partners with uh, uh, Avalon Biomedical, Mr. Stephen Yang, and also Dr. Manson Falk. Mm. Yeah, we have a very good business. He's a very humble and then sitting at the back, Dr. Manson Falk. And thank you very much for Avalon Biomedical helping us setting up this company as well. And Lastly, I would like to conclude my talk. It's basically, this is a very well known, and everyone should learn about this sentence from a JFK. But basically, our company always asks ourselves, and company and the people always ask ourselves, how we can actually do better, not for ourselves, for our patients, and also for Hong Kong. You would want to make a successful story in Hong Kong about the startup, of course, Ron and blah blah and Lucian. Uh, I guess every one of the speakers here, they want to make a successful day for Hong Kong and also for Hong Kong you as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, now, uh, our third speaker for this section is Professor Ronald Lee, the founder of Noble Heart. Well, I will introduce Professor Ronald Lee as the advocate of stem cell research in Hong Kong. Professor Lee is the founding director and then found professor of stem cells and regenerative medicine consortium at Hong Kong U, with cross appointments at Mount Sinai, John Hopkins, and the Chinese Academy of Science. So while at John Hopkins, he was twice the top young faculty and the top postdoc. And he also received American Heart Association's best study of 2005 and Grand Peking study of 2006. Uh, well, he's in. <laughs> With all these uh, excellent academic achievements, he has actually. He also has his heart for doing something in Hong Kong. So, in the past decade or so, his laboratory has received more than 200 million of R&D funding, and his inventions have led to several startups in Hong Kong and in the U.S. So, Ron, the stage is yours. Mm. Uh, thank you, Cecilia, and good afternoon, everyone. So I basically consider myself a dream chaser because I haven't been able to catch a dream yet. And as a matter of fact, I think it's like science. The race is on us, and there is no finishing line, so our dream should never end. Um, so uh, just to a routine disclosure, so I'm the uh, founder and also equity holder of this company called uh, Novo Heart. And I need to express my thanks to uh, Research Grant Council and also Innovation Technology Co Commission for providing some of the funding. All right, so uh, in Hong Kong, we often talk about real estate, finance, and lately politics. And it's really nice to have this forum so that we can talk about something else. And this afternoon, obviously, innovation, science, and technology. But first come first, what are innovation, science, and technology? Science is definitely not about mixing solution A and solution B to get solution C and hopefully with a different color and some funky precipitate. This is a critical first step to educate our kids. Uh, to learn about the ABC, but science is definitely not it. And quite interestingly, in Hong Kong, whenever we talk about science and technology, people often associate with IT, cell phone apps, games, etc. 
And these are, you know, innovative, some of them are innovative and important tools to basically bring all of us closer into proximity in the virtual space, cyberspace. But for me as a professor and a scientist, I think the scope has to be broader. How about optical fibers that allow light speed intercontinental data transmission, internet access? How about the technology to basically shrink uh, you know, the size of a mainframe computer about uh, the size of this room into something that can be put into our pocket. And in biomedicine, historically, how about the discovery of the helical structure of DNA, you know, uh, basically leading to recombinant technology, gene editing, transgenic animals, etc. Mm -hmm. And a few unknown Joes in California founded this obscure laboratory called uh, Genetech that later on only be it became uh, a hundred billion dollar, uh, US dollar company, plus a lot more. And I don't have to tell you more about the discovery of penicillin, the discovery of vaccine, that basically how many life, millions of life that they have saved. And in my mind, uh, stem cell and regenerative, regenerative medicine is basically one of these uh, uh, paradigm shifting areas. And before I go further, I also uh, want to share with you about uh, my definitions of innovation and science slash technology. It's very important that we keep in mind an innovative idea doesn't really have to be technological or scientific in nature. And in the same vein, a technological breakthrough uh, doesn't have to be innovative at all. And just to give you an example, how about today's cars, how are they fundamentally different from uh, what they were in the times of Carl Benz and Henry Ford? They still have four wheels. But it would be extremely silly for any one of us to ignore all the progresses in between, you know, airbags, GPS, and uh, uh, hybrid engine, etc. And also, regenerative medicine is not innovative. The innovative designs came from God, and we are simply trying to understand it and try to recreate it. And last of all, uh, innovation and science slash technology, they are not mutually exclusive. So, uh, what are stem cells? What is regenerative medicine? According to Merriam-Webster, regeneration by definition is the process by which an entity uh, gets renewed, revived, rejuvenated. So, uh, regenerative medicine is extremely well technically challenged. It's extremely conceptually simple. Now, it's like uh, you've got a light bulb, it's blown. What do you do? You go get a new one and put it back on. That's the idea. So, if you at the cut of the skin, uh, assuming that it's not terribly bad, uh, you're going to heal on, on your own because of the presence of skin, skin stem cells. But our other vital organs are not as lucky. You know, uh, if you get a heart attack, coronary, a myocardial infarction, your heart cells are gone. And when they're gone, they're gone forever. You can be treated, you can be managed, but a good population of the patients is going to get progressively worse and at the end stage, half daily, you're going to need an organ transplant. And when the same thing happens in the brain, that's called a stroke. Accidental injury of the spinal cord, uh, you know, depending on where the damage is, one might get paralyzed from the neck all the way down, just like uh, uh, a Hollywood star, uh, uh, Christopher Reeve, the, the, the Superman. So uh, how do we do regeneration? So uh, to make toys, we need plastic as the raw material. To remake organs, our starting material is human stem cells. But what are stem cells? So here, here's the catch. So stem cells really are just a collective term. And there are at least a billion different types. So without specifying which particular type one is working on professionally, it really doesn't mean anything at all. So it's like your teenage daughter comes home one day and tells you that I've made a friend. And you're like, tell me more. And she goes, a human. So you gotta say more, you gotta tell me more. The gender, the age, the nationality, education, occupation, etc., etc. You gotta tell more. So I know it's confusing because there are a billion different types, but for the purpose of today's talk and also what Noble Hearts is interested in, let us just focus on what this type that what many of my colleagues and I consider as the king or prince of all stem cells, pre potent stem cells. So, uh, so keep in mind, so this is very important for you to remember, there are two major uh, properties. Uh, number one is, it basically functions as an unlimited battery. So it provides you with an unlimited 
amount of raw material that you will ever need. And secondly, it has this transformative potential. It basically can become all cell types of the body. Brain cells, heart cells, pancreatic cells, liver cells, any kind of cells that you need. So it's like you have at home this uh, uh, stem cell body, you know, call it stem, if you will. So um, if you get sick, it instantly becomes a doctor, provides you with free medical health care. And if you need legal advice, Stanley instantly becomes a lawyer, an attorney. And if you need accounting help, he becomes an accounting professional as well. And what if you want to host a party, he becomes a chef. Not only one chef, but as many as you like. So are you excited? <laughs> if you are, that's exactly why the medical and the scientific community are so interested in stem cell. So this video, uh, uh, the two minute video that I'm gonna show you basically summarizes the technology that Novo Heart has developed uh, with the support of about 200 million of uh, research funding uh, plus other infrastructural support. So all you have to do basically for us to start the process is to get about 2.5 million of blood from you. And the first step is generic. So this is the technology that has been pioneered by the Bell Laureate Yamanaka. Uh, Yamanaka. So all we have to do basically is to add a bunch of reprogramming factors, like a recipe, like a cocktail, to convert your, in this case, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm happy. I thought, sorry. So uh, just add this cocktail uh, of molecular factors to convert, in this case, mononucleated your blood cells into the so-called induced pluripotent stem cell. So this is all it takes, just, just take 2.5 liters of blood from you. So as I say, this is the first generic step, and from here on, but I'm going to be basically showing you uh, the technologies that we have developed in-house in the past 15 years or so. So with this uh, pluripotent stem cell, we then add, ah, <laughs> I don't like this. I can assure you, my apology. Need some IT help? There you go. And you know what, I'm, I'm going to have to say something about this, maybe a little later. So, uh, I'm a Mac user, just to get it straight. <laughs> this is a PC, so my sincere apology. I hope you don't find this too boring. So uh, with the IPSL, we then apply this protocol uh, called ventricular specification that we have developed in the lab. Basically, we add another recipe of cocktails to basically instruct these stem cells to become human ventricular uh, muscle heart cells. So it's like telling Stanley to become a lawyer. And here we're looking at one. Within days, we can produce, mass produce billion different cells. And so these are like Lego pieces that we're going to put together to make functional tissues and hearts. And so this is no fairy dust. Uh, my son and daughter would tell you that uh, magic is not real, but science real is. But advanced science is beyond that time can be mistaken as magic. So here, if you put about a million uh, of the human ventricular heart cells into this bio reactor that we designed, that we custom tailored, uh, within uh, just a few days, about a week or so, you see a uh, trabecular-like uh, muscle strip that can be contracted in front of you. And imagine one day this is going to become like a cardiac patch for uh, curing a heart attack. Now, if we put out about 10 million, 20 million, 30 million cells into another power reactor that we have uh, designed and patented, so uh, within about a week or so, you can literally see a beating human heart uh, sitting right in front of you, and that belongs to John Doe of the US. And you can do the same with Jane Doe from Canada and other from uh, all over the world, and this basically can be personalized or custom tailored.
So this is the technology backbone of uh, the company that we have founded. And basically, we are now trying to address a major gap in the industry, uh, which is to revolutionize how drugs are discovered and developed. And secondly, uh, we are also working with my US and international colleagues to try to develop that path into reality and put into patients for curing uh, heart attacks. So uh, to end uh, this talk, uh, there, there are a few thoughts that I would like to share with you. It's not innovative to be just talking about innovations because other people in town are talking about it. It takes action. And I think this is the first fundamental question that some of the young folks may want to consider before getting into the business. And you have to ask yourself, do you really want to do it? It's okay if you don't want to, but think about it. This is not really just an option or alternative uh, for not being, for not having uh, to have to work hard or study hard and you know, if you don't want to work for a boss. And if your answer is still positive, uh, now you have to understand and accept the fact that this is not a popularity contest. It's very important that you understand this. So think about this classic uh, bell-shaped distribution of people. Most of them are sitting in the middle, right? So these are neutral people, meaning that it doesn't matter if you do it, uh, but that also means that they don't care if you are not doing it. And there's also a good population of people who are extremely conservative. So anything new, uh, anything that hasn't been done before, they think it's not going to work. And there is also a good population of people who are anti-technology. They just simply don't believe in technology. Nothing new is going to be working. And worse of all, there's another population at the far end of this spectrum is that they pretend that they promote technology, but they actually don't, all right? So you're basically left with a relatively small population of people who may support your work. You know, they can be convinced, but chances are half of these people are not going to be like the technology or they like other technologies better. So think about it, this is not a popularity contest. So use your analysis, use your passion to drive, but don't let your passion cloud your analysis. So this is an iterative process that you have to go around and around and iterate. And the next thing is you have to find trustworthy, uh, qualified people to work with you. You're going to need help. And you're going to need people that you can trust because trust me, there will be moments of doubts. And if you cannot find trustworthy people, you don't have friends, colleagues that you can trust, uh, try to engage them legally. That's a way to get things to work. And we have heard about this many times, so don't be afraid of failures. But after you fail, don't make excuses. Uh, don't assume that by doing the same thing all over again, you know, good things eventually are going to happen. Rather, make changes. That makes sense. So thank you very much. OK, thank you, Ron, for a very interesting presentation. Well, our next speaker is Dr. Wilson Wong, the CEO and founder of, Lo of Lovis Life Science. Well, after this very happy science, I think Wilson will be like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> He is, uh, I describe him, a pure bred of Hong Kong U, with all specials, masters, and PhD degrees, all from Hong Kong U. Mm. And he is indeed an entrepreneur. He graduated with his PhD degree in bioengineering from Hong Kong U in 2013, and started his company in 2014, so in one year after his graduation. Well, now, after this, well, within this year, the company has obtained support from Angel Fund and is one of, named, uh, one of the top 50 finalists in the Global Entrepreneurship Week. Listed by CNBC as 20 of the world's hottest startups in 2014 and was awarded the Youth Entrepreneur Award by the Hong Kong General Chamber of Small Medium Business in 2015. So, I think. I think we are about to hear something different. <laughs> Hello. Um, I guess I'm really different. Okay, I see the time, yeah. Okay, so I'm really different from all those speakers just now because I'm the only one who is not actually a scientist and not actually an academic. 
and I'm not getting used to give lecture because I just like sharing with people. So, um, I just now I went to the talk of my guest just now before the lunch, and what did I actually capture is like, okay, dream capture, I'm not encouraging you to catch your dream because it's really dangerous. So, just like this. Yeah. Make sure that you really know the risk. Make sure that um, you're not just motivated, uh, motivated by this event and have a startup. Because startup itself is really dangerous and you have to be really well prepared for the startup. Certainly everyone say that, oh, um, I'm not afraid of failure. But it is not saying that you are prepared to fail. I'm not afraid of failure, but I'm prepared to succeed. That's the difference. Okay, so, yeah, um, I guess anyone have heard of us before? Anyone? Yeah, we are local life sciences. We are one of the youngest startups in Baltad, started by graduates, young graduates. Uh, I, I actually, I'm a few generation younger than just now, although professor. And that's actually an advantage. That's actually an advantage. It's not a disadvantage. Let's say, oh, I come to your, well, come to Science Park, and all those uh, big brother, the CEO probably, yeah, or the uh, COO, the, uh, the, all those big brother, and say that, oh, kids, oh, okay, what can I help you? But if you are a professor, I, I don't think the COO will ask you, oh, what can I help you? So, being a youngster is actually a good thing for you to have a start of. So uh, what we do is like, okay, I'm actually working on bio materials for use in osteoarthritis. That's actually part of the research that I did after my PhD for a while. At that time, I figured out that, oh, I don't think I will try to work for someone because I have a lot of work experience in between my MPhil PhD and in between my degree and MPhil. I actually worked at in Big Four before for a few months. I worked in consulting firm, I worked in contractor, I worked in headhunter also. All together, acting together, just one year, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but by the way, this is actually good enough for me to notice what happening in the market. Okay, let's say, when I work in the uh, headhunter, I know how they have hunt those really good postdoctoral MBA holder to put them into a really big firm as a CEO. Okay, so let's say, oh, at that time, I'm thinking oh, whether I should go for a postdoc or like at the same time doing an MBA at the same school, such that my salary can pay back my MBA. And at that time, after I finish the postdoc and MBA, I would be able to get a good job. But is that what I want? Yeah, I analyzed the risk. I found that it's really hard for me to get a good postdoc because I don't have paper. Yeah, I'm a lazy student all the time. I'm just talkative. I just like to make network. So, academic, faculty is not my way. On the hand, MBA is really expensive. Yeah, I don't have the money, so forget about it. And at the same time, I don't think that the same school will accept my postdoc and MBA at the same time. So, forget about it again. So, that's why. And I don't want to work for people. That's why I have to start up. Being a working in a startup, I guess, is really lucky for me to have some good friends um, where I know in the faculty of medicine because I've actually spent like, um, well, let me see, I spent like seven years within the faculty of medicine and that actually reflected that I'm really lazy because I spent so much time on my studies. And on the other hand, I'm really lucky that during my studies, I, uh, I'm a course member, a service member of this university where I actually know a lot of people. One of them actually encouraged me to have to start up. And very luckily, at that time, because I had been thinking of a start up, I actually tell her about my plan. And that's how my luck brought me into this start up. But it doesn't mean that, oh, with his support, with her money, I can have a start up. It's all because I am well prepared for the luck to come. So, just some uh, information about my company. But today I'm just not about talking about what we do. It's actually what about startup or about the startup in here because I guess a lot of you are scientists or a lot of you may have heard about a lot of science a lecture or whatever things that make you sleepy. That's why I don't talk about my science. I don't have science. <laughs> so having a startup is just like driving a helicopter across the volcano. <laughs> and it's really dangerous, but then is rewarding. But in order to make you survive the really risky startup journey, we need something. 
So this thing makes me a bit different from a normal scientist because I don't know how to sustain my business. As you may already know, a lot of staff have been yeah, started throughout these few years in Hong Kong or in other countries. But the big problem is that most of them fail. Not because they don't have good technology, but most of them because they have the best technology and they hold the technology and they don't know how to commercialize it. So here, I'm telling you that, yeah, technology is a really important point. Sometimes it may be your own technology or sometimes it may be someone's technology. But the really important thing is that you have to pick the technology that have a bright future. Let's say maybe you found a good project in Oxford, in Harvard, and if you, are, you, you think that it can be commercialized, then it may be the start of a startup. Once you can like your investor, once you like a team, and once you get the money, then you can license the technology from the very good school that you have and bring that to Hong Kong and in China and execute it. And that's how a bottle startup work in Hong Kong. So just now talk about talent and then money. Many students yeah, actually went to a lot of uh, career talk uh, in CU, in UST, and in Hong Kong. You. And I almost, for every time, everyone would just ask me, okay, about the stuff, I actually spent a lot, a lot, a lot of money, which much, made really much difference from uh, the apps or the IT startup. So, where come the money? I can tell you, uh, my starting line is I actually lost at the starting line through the hate housing. I don't have much money in my pocket, but what made me the money to survive in this startup journey? Simply because I have a dream. I know I want to start a company in Biotech, and I know that even though I'm not uh, afraid of failure, but that I have to prepare to succeed or else how can I be responsible to my investor, my partner, and all those people, senior big brother who trust me? Therefore, I have to be really well prepared, no matter it's a proposal or the planning of the whole company. And from that, and from the luck, from the chance, I have the pitching uh, opportunity, and I get a little bit of money to have my startup. At first, at that time, I only have around Hong Kong dollar, which is just enough for me to survive, or my company to survive, survive for half year. But that's the actual case, because in this market, no one will give you three years of money, or four years of money, or five years of money, until you succeed or fail. Everyone will just test a bit of their money, bet a bit of their money in your startup, and see what's going on, what's happening next time. For us, we know that, oh, with this money, we are really hard to survive for a year. But then, what we have to do is to plan. We have to achieve our milestone, our, our proposal, in order to ask for our second round of funding. And that's why, at this stage, we survived for a year, a bit more than a year. So, on the hand, what, what happened to this? A business model, yeah. In pitching an investor, okay, a lot of people actually telling like, oh, what kind of technology they have. But indeed, from the investor side, so uh, investor will, uh, there are actually a lot of good technology. But the problem is whether the team has the expertise to manage the commercialization of the startup company. The very first question that my investor asked me is like, oh, Wilson, do you work full time in this startup? Because investor have had enough of part-time entrepreneur. Because part-time entrepreneur is really hard to succeed because being an entrepreneur, being a, 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 a founder of a company, we have to give all we have to to, uh, to handle, to manage the company and look for opportunity. Let's say for me, most of the opportunity I met, let's say the investor, the VC or PE, are those friends or people that I met in conference, met in natural, met in sharing session, or met overseas or whatever. At this time, the more you go, the luck will come to you and you will get the chance to pitch and you get the money. Mm. So that's why I can get the money and at the same time, I'm the network. Indeed, 
during the funding period of within now. Oh, as a really young graduate without a lot of technology, how can I have myself to sustain still at this stage? Because I have good friends and ever. Let's say, um, I know professor in, here in Hong Kong, in China, in US, who will actually give us support in technology. While you talk about government, or you talk about VC or finance side, we still know people who are interested in that. And hence, as an entrepreneur, what we shall do is to connect all of them, make things happen, bring the technology and in, and then bring the money in and cultivate the technology. And then what I do is to manage it properly, full time. So what else to, in order to bring the startup into a potential startup which can sustain in the long run? So these are the question mark and what are they? As summary, these are after a year of survival. I found that, because I'm not going to succeed, I guess, I don't know, no one knows. I can't, I'm not sure that I will be a successful entrepreneur or founder entrepreneur in, let's say, five years time or ten years time. But at least I tell you that in order to survive in this year, in this year, what I did and what I treasure are these things. I have a strong heart. Why? Because every time my cash flow won't last for half a year. My cash flow always lasts for like two or three months. And through a few of it, I guess many people will a few of it if, if your cash flow is running out. But in there, as a startup company, we are not afraid, not just not afraid for failure, but we are not afraid for any incident even though we don't have the cash flow. Because we can tell ourselves that, okay, even at this stage, without the cash, we, do, we close, we, do we really we want to close the company, close down the company? No, even without money, we will still keep for a while and look for more funding. So it's nothing to be afraid of, right? So that's why we have a strong heart. We have courage, courage to talk to different people. A few weeks before, I guess the last week, there's a summit, Asia summit uh, in Sheraton. Um, I, I didn't go to this summit that is uh, connecting the biotech VC and listed company. But on the other hand, I actually met one of the biggest VC on the MTR, where he went to Sheraton to attend the, 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 the summit. And at the time, I should have the courage to speak to him. And that's how I make connections in everywhere. And connection will actually help you in the long run about the startup. Because technology alone will not help you to survive. It's actually how you manage all this stuff. So at the end, you need preparation. Because even if you are brave enough, even if you have the luck, if you didn't prepare anything, you won't be able to succeed. Because let's say, a potential investor comes to you and asks you, oh, what are you going to do? Within one or two seconds, you have to answer him a really simple but direct description of what you're going to do. And sometimes you meet someone where you're going to have the chance to make a presentation, let's say, tomorrow. And that's how your hard work preparation contributes in this situation. Let's say in my computer, I have a hundred PowerPoint where I can always present to any audience. And that we call preparation. With this stuff, luck is just a piece of cake. And you will be able to make the best use of, the, of your luck and be a successful startup. Okay, thank you.